Welcome to the 11th mini lecture of 7505 NSE Project Management. We've been talking through the course and we've been doing all the hard yards with project networks and a lot of mathematics and we've been talking about all of those things that help get the project towards its successful completion. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. But also what we're talking about are those other areas that a project manager really depends upon. And that is being able to get feedback as to how the project is going and how to be able to control it. No different from driving a car. You look at the instruments in the car, you find out how fast you're going, how much petrol you've got left, how much the engine's turning over, perhaps uh, what your oil pressure is, etc. And you make adjustments according to that. A project is no different. So evaluation and control is really important. So in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the operation of the project control cycle. We're going to be talking about the strengths and weaknesses of common project evaluation control methods. And there are a whole range that a project manager can use. We're going to be explaining how an earned value management system works and how it's used in project evaluation. That is, we're going to be using that learning about a technique that's used in a lot of complex projects today, especially in the aerospace industry. And we're going to be seeing as to how it gives an instant feedback to a project manager on just how well the project's going. We're going to be talking about the four different types of project termination and the seven steps in the project closeout process. People often make mistakes in the project closeout and the valuable lessons learned, for example, are never passed on for future projects. We're going to explain why some projects may be terminated early and the challenges and components of a final project report itself. Obviously in this mini lecture we can only just touch on the major parts but these are important in terms of how we can actually get towards a successful completion. Well first of all the project control cycle itself. We spoke in an earlier lecture about setting the goals and this means we can set up a baseline especially with our work breakdown structure itself. Once we've got a work breakdown structure we can start the cycle and we can measure progress and we can measure progress in terms of actually first of all the activities that have uh, being completed, the time it does compared to the original schedule, the budget that's being used up and also as to whether we need extra resources going along the line. We can then compare the actual with the planned, that is how we're actually performing compared to what did we originally set out to do in our plan. And from comparing actual and plan we can figure out what the gap is and with the gap we can take remedial action. And so we're constantly doing this right throughout the project, making constant adjustments along the way, making sure that if we learn anything important, we incorporate that in as part of our future plan, and we can ensure that right throughout the project there is a continuous improvement in trying to learn as we go along and incorporate this into the actual cycle itself. We'll take a look at some of the different tools that he use. And for example, we'll use projects in that Sierra, which uses the S-curve. And the S-curve is simply where we take a look at the elapsed time in a project and we look at the cumulative spend that we're taking out of our budget. And for example, in this example uh, that we have here, at week 21, we can say, well, our budgeted spend was $50,000, but we've only spent $40,000. And some people might say, well, that's good, isn't it? You haven't spent as much as you planned. But, as we'll find out in the lecture, that may not be a good sign. It may simply mean we're behind schedule or we simply haven't been able to spend the money at an efficient rate. And so while the S-curve tells us that we've got variance, it doesn't tell us why. We'll look at the tracking Gantt chart. We covered Gantt charts earlier. And here on a tracking Gantt chart, we can see with the different activities that we, it tells us exactly as to which ones are completed. So project A is 100% already completed, whereas project B is only 61% completed. So a tracking Gantt chart is really good because it tells us exactly where we are with a project. But the big thing is it's not telling us whether what any problems are if we finish late. And the trouble is that with the tracking Gantt chart, we don't know of any problems until the activity has been completed. So after taking a look at the S-curve, we now have to take a look at the tracking Gantt chart, something we covered in a previous lecture. We said Gantt charts are good. 
they give a visual representation. And here we can see the visual representation is really good. On this tracking GAN chart, it's showing as to how much is completed. A's been completed at 100%, B's 61% completed, and so on. Uh, we can see that D and E haven't even started. So a tracking GAN chart is good, and it simply says as to where we are, and it shows positive and negative deviations, but again, it's not telling us the why. And very often with a tracking GAN chart, it means that we find out too late as to whether there is a problem or not. Earn value management takes a look and says, OK, the S-curve's good for linking cost and schedule, but it doesn't tell us the problems. The GAN chart tells us as to how schedule and performance are going, but it doesn't tell us the reason why. Earn value is linking cost and schedule and performance all together. And we'll see this by studying the different features that make up an earned value management system. Earned value management is used in the aerospace industry, it's used on defence contracts, and particularly it's being used more and more on government contracts because people have found that earned value management tells them a lot more about a project than other metrics that are used. And so earned value is where we actually take a look at what the planned value is, the cost estimate over the project life cycle, the earned value itself, that is the real budgeted cost or value of work that's been achieved. Then we look at the actual cost of work performed itself, and then the budgeted cost of work performed. And then what we come up with are two important formula. What we have is what we call schedule variance or the schedule performance index, SPI, which is earned value divided by plan value, and the cost performance index or cost variation, which is earned value over the actual cost of work performed. Now, what we'll do in the course is we'll see that when we put in actual figures from examples, if we get one, that is earned value divided by plan value for SPI is one, that's good we're going exactly as planned. If we've got a figure greater than one, we're exceeding expectations, but if it's less than one, we're operating at less than 100% efficiency. It's the same with cost performance index. So SPI and CPI, if the figures are less than one, immediately a project manager says, we're not performing at 100% efficiency. So these are really important metrics that are used in project management. And learning how to do them is, in fact, extremely simple. And we'll be doing a number of uh, different examples so that you can understand how it's calculated and apply it in the future if you get on a project. We now come to the area of project termination itself. And the one thing that we find is that finishing off a project, especially a really large one, is often a project in itself. And, of course, the one thing that we find is that it's like everything else. Think about doing your assignments. When you're getting towards the end of the assignment, do you feel that sort of rush of, I can't wait to get it finished? And very often you find that when you complete the assignment, there are a few things you've left undone. That is, I can't be bothered to do the proofreading, or I can't, I can't be bothered to check back as to whether I should have included all these parts of the document as part of my submitted report. Projects are no different. People are the same. So if we look at why projects are terminated, first of all, extinction. That is, it's finished. It can either be a successful project, and that means it's finished, or it can be unsuccessful and it's wound up, such as the Royal Australian Navy's Sea Sprite helicopter project was stopped uh, once it had reached a certain point because people said, we're just putting money in after bad. Addition is where the actual project team itself is instituted as a group within an organisation. And for example, this often happens in organisations such as Apple, where they come out with a new product itself, and then the people who work on the project are then incorporated into part of the organisation that does this, the sustainment of that product during its life of time. There's integration, where once the project's finished, the people go back into the organisation from where they came originally. And then, of course, there's starvation. That is, people simply say, look, this project's not going anywhere. Let's just starve it of funds and simply let it die. Natural termination itself. 
This is where the project finishes as a result of its successful completion. What are the different things that we'll be looking at here? Well, first of all, there's getting the work finished. And it's interesting. Go back to finishing the house. When you have a house built, at the end, there are lots of little things that need to be done, little uh, areas where the paint was marked by another tradesman have got to be done over again. And it's amazing when you build a house to find that builders say, yes, the house is finished and ready for handover. Our quality assurance people have inspected it. But in fact, it's not really finished. There are jobs that have just been left undone in the rush to go on to the next job. Projects are no different itself. This handing over the product. That is, what are you going to do to hand over the product? Again, going back to your own house, building a house. When the builder hands the uh, house over to you, then there's got to be some sort of uh, procedure that you go through for accepting the house, where you do your own inspection. There's gaining acceptance. That is, what you go through in handing over the product, what decides whether you're going to accept it or whether you're going to reject it in the end. And this often happens with projects People say, yes, I've gone through the handing over of the product, but I'm not satisfied with this, this and this. And that has to be corrected before I'll approve the project. This harvesting the benefits, that is, has the project actually achieved what it's set out to do? For example, when an airline accepts its new Boeing uh, 787 into service and they start operating it, are they actually making the cost savings they thought they would? Are the customers really satisfied with this new aircraft? And of course we know with the Boeing 787, uh, customers have been amazingly happy after ordering the aircraft to find out that people like flying in it and also it is an economical aircraft to operate. Then there's the next one, important, lessons learned, reviewing how it all went. And very often people are in such a rush to go on to a next project that very often this is left out. And so what happens is the mistakes made on this project are made on the next project that's executed. So reviewing how it all went is really important to making sure we learn the lessons of the past and apply them to the future. Putting it all to bed. Now this is a funny expression, but really it sums it up. And that is, how do we really tie it all up? That is, for example, there may have been that materials that have been purchased from suppliers. And of course, you have to wind up your actual budget for the project by putting it all in and saying, OK, how do we actually go in terms of what we spent versus what we plan? And six months later, you find one of your suppliers says, I found an invoice for $100,000 worth of goods that I didn't send out to you. But you've closed off your budget. So it's important to identify, has everyone sent in their invoices? And the final one is disbanding the team. And of course, this is important. People want to finish on a high. And very often, people rush from one project to another without making people feel, look, you've been part of a really important project in this company's existence. And we want to show, first of all, our appreciation to you. Make sure that you get the work assignments that you may have been promised as a result of working on this project. All of these are important in making sure that we have this smooth transition when we finish a project. So why is it so difficult to close out a project? What we've just talked about is easy. Well, first of all, project sign-offs can be a bit of a demotivator. After dealing with all the major problems on the actual project itself, getting rid of all these small points, some people see as being background noise. Hey, you know, it's just so small I can't be bothered. Constraints cause back-end problems. That is, you might find that people are actually being moved on to the next projects early, and so suddenly you find that you haven't got enough people to do all those close-out activities. Close-out activities themselves have got a low priority, especially with their uh, other projects going on. Lessons learned is often a tick in the box, purely a bookkeeping exercise. And also, a lot of people say, as we said in the definition of stuff, Projects are unique. And people say, yeah, but this project was so unique. It's different from other projects. But what we have to do is say, all projects, even with their uniqueness, have certain things that are common to other projects. So let's make sure we do them right. 
The final report itself is really a record of the project. And this is where we put all the loose ends together. We go through and we look at the project performance, the administrative performance, how we tracked and controlled progress, how well the organisational structure worked, how well we were supported by other people, how well did the team perform, did we get the skills we actually set out to get, were there any shortfalls in the performance that could have been fixed by better training for the future or by simply ensuring that people that we get are from the A team and not the B team. How did our project management techniques work? Is there other training that we can do in the future to correct it? And what were the benefits to the organisation and the customer from this project itself? These are all important points in making sure we tie up a project and make sure that the transition means that future projects are done better and every lesson that's been learned is being captured, recorded and passed on. And also, customers are happy with what they've received from the contractor organisation. So in summary, we've looked at project cycles, the strengths and weaknesses of the different types of control methods. We've looked at earned value management very simply and seen as to how it gives those two important metrics, CPI and SPI, and tell the project manager immediately how the project is going in terms of its schedule efficiency and its spending efficiency. We've looked at termination in the four different forms and the seven steps in the project closeout project. We've looked at why it's sometimes not done very well and we've described the challenges and components of making sure the final project report captures accurately how the project performed and make sure that it gives a good record that helps us do a better job in the future on our other projects. Thank you.